I'm so thankful for our, um, everyone in our church who uses their spiritual gifts and abilities in different ways, for our musicians and singers who do that. And even now, before the service, a lot of the music you hear in the courtyard and you hear online is actually our worship team recorded and them doing different worship songs. And so I'm, it's just a gift to have people who are passionate about worship leading us. Um, we're kicking off the series, Adore. And we're going to be looking at what it means to really adore Jesus in this Christmas season. But I want to begin by telling you that I know something about you. I'm, I'm almost 100% sure I'm accurate. And you say, well, even if I don't know you personally, how could I know something about you? Because it's a pretty universal thing. I have a suspicion, and you can tell me later if I'm wrong, but I have a suspicion that there is somebody that you occasionally avoid. That there's people whose name come up on your caller ID that you're kind of like, oh, we'll let that go to voicemail. There's, that there's, there's people who, who just, when you interact with them, you know if you start a conversation with them, you know that there's never an off-ramp. They just don't know how to stop. So if you do, it's going to be a long thing. And it's one of those things where you're going, yeah, yeah, well, I really have to go because my kids are, and I, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, well then, okay, so thanks so much. I got, yeah, yeah. You know, th- th- there's, there's some people like, you're, you just, I, I, know, I know some families I've talked to that have been, are very strong Christian families they will even sometimes have a family member they avoid who's so devoutly Christian and so devoutly religious, that's all they talk about, and they're almost overwhelming, and even though you already know Jesus, they want to make sure you're really saved, and some, I, I've heard of families that like the kids will literally go and hide under their beds when this family member comes over, because they're like, we don't, we love them, but we just don't want to see them and talk with them. We, we can, you know, we can avoid certain things. I have an entire group of people I avoid. There's an entire group of people that I avoid. They're called telemarketers. Uh, when, when I see a number come up and I don't recognize it, uh, if I know it's a telemarketer, or if I get a telemarketer, I'll, put, I'll actually block their phone number. I avoid them so much, I don't ever want to hear from them again. And, and so if, we, if we're all honest, there's, there's people that just, uh, that can kind of be difficult and challenging for us, and we avoid some people. Now, here's one of the good news things about Christmas time. One of the reasons we can adore our God, Jesus who came among us, is, is that, that God didn't avoid us. God didn't didn't see us coming and go, oh, I'm going to head over this direction a little bit. God knows everything about you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows everything about every single one of us, and he came near to us. He could have gone the other way. God could have said, you know what? You've sinned. You've messed up. You're a problem. I'm not going to deal with you. But God came near. As a matter of fact, one of the names in the Bible for Jesus is Emmanuel. You know what the name Emmanuel means? God with us. That God came near. He knows us. He knows all about us. And he could could have avoided us. He could have blocked us out, but God drew near. And not just kind of near. God didn't just come to this earth and dwell in human flesh. But God comes to dwell in you and live in you. If you become a follower of Jesus by his Holy Spirit, God Almighty, you can't get any closer than this. You can't be more Emmanuel, God with us, than moving in and living inside of you. That's what God does. That's what Jesus came to do. I thank God that he doesn't avoid us. He doesn't push us aside. He knows us and he loves us and he embraces us. And so this Christmas season, we're going to talk about adoring Jesus and worshiping him. And in the Gospel of John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we find the Christmas story, but it's a Christmas story entirely different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the synoptics. They're all very similar. But John tells the Christmas story very differently. With John, there's no shepherds, there's no angels, there's no wise men, there's no manger, That's not in John, but he still tells the Christmas story. He tells it from a heavenly perspective, almost like a theologian trying to go into the depths of what it really is all about. So so John, this is John's version of the manger and of Jesus coming. But in talking about what what happened is all true, but he doesn't talk about the location and the details. He talks about what's happening in the heart of God and the spiritual realms. Listen to the Gospel of John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. If you have your own Bible, follow along, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. That word is Logos. That means Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. 
He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's John's version of the Christmas story. The coming of Jesus, the Word. Now, if you're reading this passage, and you're in the ancient world, the first century, when when John was inspired to write these words, if you're reading this in the first century, and you have a Jewish background, which a lot of the readers would have, and you begin reading these words, something comes to mind. Let's, let's look at how he begins. There's another book in the Bible that begins with these words. In the beginning. Any Jewish person in the first century would have gone, Genesis 1. The first book of the Bible is Genesis. The very first chapter of Genesis, the very first verse begins, in the beginning. So when John says, in the beginning, a Jewish listener would go, oh, he's quoting the beginning of the the creation of all things. And do you remember in the book of Genesis how God created? He created with his word. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the sea be filled with sea creatures. And there was. God created with his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is Jesus in the beginning. So he's telling the Christian, but but then the word took on flesh. So we're going to walk through John chapter 1. Keep your Bible open to John chapter 1, and we're going to walk through this together, and we're going to see how how we're invited to adore Jesus when we understand who he is. So the first thing we see, and if you're a note taker, this is on your app and on, on on the website, adore Jesus because he is the word. A Jewish person would have noticed in the beginning, but a Roman person who wasn't Jewish would have noticed word, logos. In the beginning was the Logos. To the Roman mind, the Logos was, was, was sort of divine wisdom, divine insight. So, 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 so John, is, John is talking about uh, talking to both the Jewish people that are reading and listening, but also to the Roman people. To say to all of them, Jesus is for everybody. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And for, and, and for the Roman mind, that Logos was sort of was wisdom, was insight. Jesus is the the ultimate wisdom of God revealed in human history, that the wisdom of God, the truth of God came to walk among us. So here's a question for you this morning. How have you found wisdom in Jesus, the word of God? How have you found wisdom? If you've been walking with Jesus for, at at our night of worship, we had two people share a testimony that since January 26th, this year, they've been walking with Jesus. Sherry's been walking with Jesus since she was five years old. I'm really good with math. That makes you 45, right, honey? Exactly. Uh, but but, but you know, no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, you discover that, 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 he is, that he is the wisdom of God and reveals that wisdom to us. And, and, and so the, the question is, how have you found wisdom in Jesus, the Word? As, as you walk through life, if you walk with Jesus who's come near, God who's with you, I, I would not know how to be a husband if it wasn't for the wisdom of Jesus through his written Word and through the leading of his Holy Spirit. I would mess up constantly. I wouldn't know how to be a dad. I wouldn't know how to be a pastor. I wouldn't know how to be a friend. It's the we we don't just worship Jesus who came two thousand years ago, died on the cross, and went back to heaven. He's with us now through His Holy Spirit, and He grants us wisdom. Do you walk in the wisdom of Jesus every day? That's what it means to be a disciple to walk in Jesus' ways. Some years ago, some of you might remember this, some of you are maybe too young to even remember this, but some years ago, lots and lots of people wore a band on their wrist. Sometimes it was a plastic band, sometimes it was a kind of a cloth thing, and it had four letters on it, four consonants. They were WWJD. Y'all remember that? Some of you remember that? Okay. And lots of people had them on. Sports figures had them on, and different people had them on. And it was, the question was, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Now, here was the problem with that, that, whole, that whole fad, and that was kind of a fad for people did, what would Jesus do? One problem was the people who made those bracelets and stuff, another group that started making them, ended up suing each other. So that was kind of a problem, because I'm not sure that would be Jesus' thing. It's a big lawsuit about what would Jesus do. But also, the problem with me saying, with me asking the question, what would Jesus do, is that I'm going to come up with my opinion of what Jesus would do. And in most cases, I think Jesus would agree with me. See the problem? If I think, what would Jesus do, in my mind, I'm going to start thinking Jesus always agrees with me, because that's not how I see the world. I would ask the question, what did Jesus do? How did he live? How did he love? 
And if we can follow what he did, we will walk in his wisdom. So I encourage you this Christmas season to understand that Jesus is with you, God is with you, and he wants to lead you into his wisdom. He wants to guide you to where he wants to take you. And then you continue on in the Gospel of John, continue in verse 1 of chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. We adore Jesus because he is God. He is divine. He is the divine God who came and walked among us. Look with me again at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ was fully, completely divine. Now, I, it's hard to explain and to understand fully the, the mystery of the Trinity, but we believe in one God who exists one in being, one God, but that God exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One in being, one God who exists eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ was fully divine. So, so that in John chapter 14, when Philip says to Jesus, he says, Jesus, just show us the Father. Show us the Father. Then we'll understand. Then we'll believe. Just show us the Father. And do you know how Jesus responded? He said, have I been with you so long and you do not know me? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Philip's saying, show us the Father. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me? And he goes on to say, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What's Jesus saying? I am divine. I am God Almighty. And at that moment when Jesus said that, he was declaring what, what the Bible teaches is true from beginning to end, that he is God with us. We have to understand that he is fully divine. In John chapter 20, after Jesus died on the cross and been raised again in glory, Jesus shows up to his disciples. And he's, he's risen, he's alive again. And he shows up, but Thomas isn't there. One of the disciples isn't there. So they all say to Thomas, Thomas, Jesus is alive, he rose again, but Thomas hadn't seen him. And Thomas says, I doubt it. He says, I, he, Thomas says, I won't believe he's alive until I see him with my eyes, and Thomas says, until I can put my hand in the holes in his hand from the nail prints and put my hand in the side where they, where they stabbed him with a sword, I mean, with, with a spear. He says, I won't believe until I can touch his hands, see with my eyes, touch his side. So about a week later in John 20, Jesus shows up, and Thomas is there. And I love it. Jesus doesn't scold Thomas. You know what he says? He says, Thomas, come and touch my hand touch my side. Thomas said, that's what it takes for you to believe. I want you to know I'm alive. I'm risen. You know how Thomas responds? He responds with these words, my Lord and my God. At that moment, if Jesus was just a good rabbi, he would have said, Thomas, don't say that. No, no. I'm, I'm just a great teacher. I'm just a great rabbi. No. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus receives it. Why? Because he is Thomas's Lord and God, and he is your Lord and God if you believe in him. He's even Lord and God if you don't, but he's your Lord if you put your faith in him. Jesus was God in human flesh, God who walked among us. So here's the question. Do you recognize that God is with you now, and, is, and it is always now? God is with you right now, and you live in an eternal, perpetual now. When is now? Right now. When is the next now? Now. You know, you know what it is right now? Now. He, he's present. He, 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 he is the God who is with you always. Now, do you recognize that God is with you all the time? When you wake up in the morning, God is with you. He is Emmanuel, God, not just in a theological sense, he is with you right there at that moment. For some of you, some of you that are online, you've been sheltering in place and you've been home not interacting with people for a long time. Some folks have been shut down almost completely and you haven't had other people with you. And you gotta say, but wait a minute, I'm alone, but I'm not alone. God is with me now and now and now and always. And we draw hope from that and we draw comfort from that. When you're in great moments, God is with you. When you're in really tough moments, God is with you to be your strength. When you're doing things you shouldn't be doing and you hope God doesn't notice, right? As if he doesn't notice, right? God is with you then. He is Emmanuel, God with us always. And I think particularly those people in this season right now who are feeling loneliness and the heaviness of being isolated and what hope it is to know that God is with us. Early on in the whole, this whole COVID season, um, 
our first granddaughter was born. And Sherry flew to Michigan to see our first granddaughter and to be there at that, in that season. And, and you know, uh, this was kind of before things were shut down and all that kind of stuff. And so she was able to go there. Well, then all of a sudden, they were, everything was shutting down. And so she ended up getting stuck in Michigan for six weeks. She called me. She was almost in tears. Kevin, I have to stay here with the grandkids. I can't come be home with you. She was so sad. I, you can, I can almost feel the, feel the tears come, dripping through the phone. She said, I'm stuck here, and I'm not going to come back for a month and a half. And, and I just I felt so bad for her. Um, and, uh, but, but here's the thing. So for six weeks, I, and we're empty nesters. I was in our home alone. Now, some, did some work from home a little bit here, but when things were shut down, there were times I was just at home alone. I'm not alone a whole lot. But here's, here's the beautiful thing. I wasn't alone. Two things happened during those six weeks. Two big sort of things in my life that were kind of guiding me through that time. First of all, I went shopping and I made about 30 big, giant, wonderful burritos all at once and froze them. And then I made a big pot of spaghetti sauce, boiled a bunch of noodles, and I put a bunch of bowls with noodles and spaghetti sauce and froze those. So for six weeks, I ate burritos and sp frozen spaghetti. I would microwave them. I made my own microwavable meal. So one thing was I, I still ate, but I just ate a little differently than I normally do. Although not that differently. I still eat, love that kind of stuff. But, but also for those whole six weeks, um, I realized I was not alone. I'd get up and have my exercise time, and I'd be with Jesus. I'd microwave my frozen burrito for lunch, and I'd share a burrito with Jesus. I mean, he didn't eat it, but I just, you know, I was there. I, I experienced his presence. I want to say for those of you that are sheltering at home, those of you that are still, you know, shut down, seek to recognize the presence of Jesus through the season, because you're not alone. He doesn't avoid you. He comes right to you where you are every moment of every day. You're never alone. You're never alone. And then John goes on, and, and John just gives us all these reasons we can adore Jesus. He shows us who he is so we can be free to adore him. Adore Jesus because he is eternal. He is eternal. John 1, 2, he was with God in the beginning. There's a sense of timelessness that Jesus and the Father have been together forever, the Son, the Father, and the Spirit eternally in unity. And, and so recognize that, you know what, there's some people who won't be there for you any given moment. There's some people whose lives may end and they'll no longer be, be there to be around you, but he is eternal. If you walk with Jesus, he's with you all the time, forever and ever. And John goes on, adore Jesus because he is the creator. We should adore him because he is the creator. Look at verse three. We read, through him, through Jesus, I love the language here. All things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. <laughs> everything that's been created was created by him, everything. And by the way, everything was created. God spoke, and out of nothing, he spoke things into existence. So when you, when you look at creation, you should be in awe. When you see art, you think about the artist. When you see creation, you think about the artist, the creator, our God. If you see a, if you see a desert scene, if you've been in the desert with like, with like the red rocks and, the, and the, the towers and spires of rocks that have just, you know, you look and go, God is good. Look what he made. If you've ever been to the North or South Poles or places that are very, very cold with, with glaciers and ice, I know people that, we've never done a cruise, but I know people that really love doing cruises. And they'll oftentimes say, I'll say, what was your favorite cruise ever? And it's almost always the same one. Oh, we did an Alaska cruise. And I said, why? They said, because when you go along, you look at just, there, there's something about the beauty of that part of the world that so few people have actually ever seen. But when you see that there's a beauty to it, when you look at, the, when you look at an insect, a, a bumblebee, or, or, or different, you know, and you, if you look closely, just the beauty and the intricacy of what God has made. When you get a microscope and look at the human cell and see what God has made, you just go, man, the, the, the beauty and, and, and the, the, the complexity and yet simplicity of all that God has made. Uh, Sherry had a, 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 friend, a guy that we got to know when we were in Alaska ask us if we'd ever seen the, seen the Aurora Borealis, have seen the Northern Lights, and he had pictures of them. Have you ever seen that? If you, you, could, you could look up Aurora Borealis and, and look at them sometime online. It's, it's amazing. Um, animals. All the different creatures, the ones we've seen, the ones we, we haven't seen. I remember our son, our son I asked Sherry in the first service, it was our son Nate. He had a bearded dragon. It was one of his pets that he had growing up. It was about, probably about this, his name, Mo. I think his name was Mo. But anyway, he had this bearded dragon. He would do his homework, sit at his desk, do his homework with this bearded dragon resting on his shoulder. But you look at this thing and you just go, God made that. Amazing. We adore God because he is the creator God. And it goes on in verse 10, and it says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, God made everything, the world did not recognize him. 
God created everything. And it's very interesting when you read in the book of Genesis, and again, John 1 and the beginning of Genesis have similar kind of parallels. But when, when you read the book of Genesis, you realize that God is creating. He's, God's kind of building and building and building and building and speaking and building. And then God comes to the pinnacle of his creation, the best of his creation. And you know what the best of his creation was? You. People. Then he made a man and, his, and a woman in his image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female. He created them. When you're amazed by creation, when you drive along this beautiful coast here, just, you know, just a short distance over here, and, and just look at what God's made, you go, this is incredible. When you go out on a, on a night and the sky is just, just dark and you see the stars, you go, amazing. And God, God loves all that. But you know what God celebrates the most in creation? You. In Psalm 139, it says that you were formed and shaped in your mother's womb, that God's very hands were at work forming and shaping you and knitting you together, and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. When you're in awe of creation, don't forget to look in the mirror. And you, you, you might look in the mirror and go, I like the sunset better. Um, I like the ocean set, you know, the ocean coast better. But I'm telling you, when God looks at creation, he celebrates you. Here's a question for you. Do you realize that of all God, of all God made, he delights in you the most? Well, with what God has created, he delights the most in people. That's us. God delights in us. He's come near to us. We adore Jesus because he is the life and the light. And again, John just continues to kind of lay out all these different reasons that we need to be able to see and, and, and celebrate and adore him because he is the life and the light. Look with me at John 1, 4, and 5. In him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then you go to verse 9, and listen to this. The true light that gives light to everyone, this is Jesus, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, again, he's the creator, the world did not recognize him. Do you understand that in Jesus is life and light? Wait, is there a message for the world right now in that? Light and life. In times of darkness, in times of struggle, he brings light, he brings life. Here's a question for you. When it is dark and life feels uncertain, how do you hold, how do you hold on to Jesus? When it is dark and life feels uncertain, how do you hold on to Jesus? And I'll tell you right now, it is a time for many people, this is a, it's a dark and uncertain time. With all uncertainty is not knowing what's coming next or not when so, knowing something ends. We have no idea what, what two months, six months, eight months hold. And people can, people can guess. And I, you know, it was, you know, people, we, we were hoping at Shoreline this, this would be all over and we could worship in the worship center last Easter. Following me? <laughs> we don't know. So what do you hold on to in those times? Let me give you three thoughts. And just these are three simple, practical things that could radically revolutionize your life if you hear them and, and kind of act on them. One is if you want something to hold on to and hold on to Jesus in a time like this is to, to just open up this book, the scriptures. This is my second Bible. My, this is my, my present Bible right now. Uh, my first Bible was this exact same Bible, a Revised Standard Version, Harper Study Bible with study notes by Harold Lenzel. Uh, it was a Bible given to me right when the day I became, like the week I became a Christian. Someone gave me that Bible. I had it for about four years. And then, and then I put it on top of my car and drove off, my Opal Manta, sweet car. Um, but I put it on top of my car, drove off, and got somewhere and realized I'd left it on top of the car, drove back there because I, I thought I can't lose my Bible. It was gone. Bought an identical one, put an identical big cross Bible cover on it, because that's what you do when you're, I was 16 when I got it, and I was 20 when I got my second Bible. Uh, and about every four or five years, I retire my Bible, and I go to a new Bible. And so I, I, I try to just continue to have fresh learning from the Bible. But just open the scriptures, read the Bible every day. You want to connect with Jesus? Open his word. We have a Bible reading guide on our website that we update every single week, year-round, till Jesus returns. It's there to help you out if you're not quite sure where to start. But open up the word every day. And then prayer. You want to connect with Jesus in times that are uncertain and difficult? Talk to him. Jesus, I'm afraid right now. Jesus, I'm, I'm uncertain about this. Jesus, our business is up in the air and we have no idea what's coming next and nobody knows. And, and, and Lord, hold us close. 
Jesus, I'm lonely. Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and rejoicing. You know what? It's really hard right now to share good news with some people because people are struggling. So something really good happens. Who do you talk to? It's hard to share good news with people. Are like, well, my life's falling apart. I don't really want to. I mean, they, they'll listen, but you don't know if they really are excited. But here's the thing. Jesus will always be excited. Talk to him about it. Share your joys. Share your sorrows. So scripture, prayer, and then community. Connect with God's people. Even if it's an online, and people, I know people are getting weary with all the online stuff, but you need to connect with other Christians. And if, if you're at home and you're not connecting, get into a small group, contact the church and say, man, I want to just get with a few people on a weekly basis or every couple of weeks and interact with other Christians and talk and pray together. We will connect you. There's stuff going on like that. If, if you, we've got some things going on on campus where we do social distancing, even being here in the courtyard, and even being in your cars, and we've got a growing, our, our, hey, two tailgaters next to each other, we've got a whole two rows of cars over here, our our car congregation is growing. But isn't there something different about being together? And you can wave at the people in the car next to you. Just connect with God's people. And if you're not sure how to connect, contact the church. We're here to help build that bridge and to connect you. And, and then John just continues on, just pouring out all these reasons that we can adore Jesus. Adore Jesus because he is the way to the Father. He is the one way to come into the presence of the Father. Look at verses 12 and 13 of John chapter 1. Yet to all who did receive him, everyone who received Jesus, that's putting your faith in him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, or a husband's will, listen to this, but born of God. You come into a relationship with God the Father, have your sins cleansed through Jesus Christ. He's made a way to invite us home. So here's my question for you. Have you entered by the one door that is wide open? Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He said himself, I am the door. He is the, but you know what? That door is open. Always open. He won't grab anybody and drag them through it, but he will invite people to walk through the door. If you've come to, to the Father through faith in Jesus, adore Jesus for opening the door and being the door. If you've never come to put your faith in the Father through Jesus, I encourage you this Christmas season, keep coming to Shoreline. Through this Adore series, through our Christmas Eve services, all will be in person here, in cars, and online. But keep coming and stay connected because you're going to hear the story of Jesus. And if you want to walk through that door and receive him, you'll have plenty of opportunity to do that. You can even watch the service from our Wednesday night service this, this past Wednesday, our night of worship, and we walk through that simple message of the gospel. But we want you to understand what Jesus has done. He's opened the door and made the way. And John just continues on. We can adore Jesus because he is the only son. Jesus Christ is the only son of God. Now you say, well, doesn't the Bible say that when we put our faith in him, we become God's daughters and God's sons? Doesn't the Bible say that? Yes. We are children of God. We are his sons and his daughters. But Jesus is the son of God in a totally different, unique way. He's the eternal son of God. So look with me at John 1.14. The word became flesh. He made his dwelling among us, listen to this, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth, the glory of the one and only Son. Yes, we can become children of God through faith in Jesus, but he is the one and only eternal Son of God. Do you celebrate that? Do you adore him for that? Do you embrace Jesus as the one who is wholly different than all others? Jesus was the one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the beauty of what the scripture teaches is, and he invites everyone. Not everyone receives the gift, but he invites everyone. And then we adore Jesus because he is the grace and the truth. Jesus Christ is grace and truth. Look at John 1.14 again. The word became flesh, that's Christmas, the birth of Jesus, he made his dwelling among us, the incarnation. He comes and walk, walks with us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. He's the only Son of God who came from the Father. But listen to this. Full of grace and truth. Jesus comes with amazing, unbelievable grace. He forgives. He's gentle. He extends his, his undeserved favor to all who will receive it but he is also absolute truth. He not only speaks the truth, he is the truth. And grace with no truth becomes mushy, sentimental thought. 
And truth with no grace becomes harsh dogmatism. But grace and truth together is beautiful. And Jesus came full of grace and truth. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we will extend grace to people, but also speak the truth. We'll, we'll always be gracious and kind, but we'll always hold to that which is true. That's what Christians do. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And so with the moments we have left, I want to give you just some ideas for some acts of adoration. If we're, this whole series is called Adore. And adoring isn't just singing a song, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ Lord. That's good, but it's more than just singing a song. Adoration is how we live our lives. We can adore God in the flow of a normal day, a normal week. We walk adoring God and lifting him up. And so how do we do that? Here's some thoughts. Acts of adoration. To walk in wisdom. If he is the logos, the wisdom of God, can we walk in his word? I want to challenge you to this Christmas season, open this, maybe just try from now to the end of the year of opening this book every single day. Go on the Shoreline website and look at the daily reading. You can click on it. It'll open it out in your phone or open it in your iPad or your computer, or you could open it, get the passage to open it in just a regular paper Bible. I do both at different times throughout the course of the day, but I start my morning with actually with my other, my Bible that's at home, my devotional Bible, and I, and I open the word every day. And, and as you read the word, adore him. Get to know who he is and celebrate him. A lot of the readings this Christmas season are going to be around the Christmas story. So adore him and worship him. Acts of adoration. Celebrate creation. If he is the creator, if he's made all things good and beautiful, then celebrate it. So I'm going to give you encouragement to take a walk or a drive. If, you're, if you live here and if you're all in the courtyard and, and your cars, you're, you can even do it right after the service day. Just go along the coast for about 10 minutes. And the little scenic the, the turnouts there, just pull aside. And look at what God has made. In the middle of this crazy time, just stop and just, oh, wait, God, God's creator. God, this is beautiful. This is glorious. If you live in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, and many, we know many people who are part of Shoreline live in other places, find a place outdoors that's beautiful. And if you're allowed to go out and take a walk, do that. If you can take a drive, do that. But just slow down and look at what God has made. And as you're looking at what God has made and rejoicing, can I suggest that the next time you look in a mirror, you just pause. Just like you're pulling off a little scenic route and looking at the ocean. Pause and look and say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made by the hand of God. And of all the things that God celebrates in creation, he celebrates people the most. Can you drink that in? Can you kick aside all the worldly garbage that talks about how you're supposed to look and all that silliness? Say, I've been made in the image of the living God and he delights in me. Would you even dare to do that? That would be adoring him. Why? Because he's the creator. He's the painter. He's the artist. And when you celebrate his creation, you celebrate him. Or, or just another, another thought. Go online and look at amazing pictures. You can go on, uh, uh, go on Google or go on some search tool and say, amazing pictures of the desert. Amazing pictures of oceans. Amazing pictures of elephants. I did that this week, just as I was getting ready for my sermon. I did elephants. Elephants are, they're incredible. I don't, I've always kind of liked elephants, but it's like, I'm looking at, you can get all caught up in this, and you can look at, even if you can't get out of your house, you can look at creation and look at these pictures and say, God, look what you've done. You are creator, you are good. Maybe for some of you, as, as it's becoming wintertime, get a bird feeder. As, as birds are traveling north to south looking for some food, get a bird feeder. They, you can just kind of look at the birds when they come. Put it near your house so you can see them and enjoy them. And some of you are like, I've got those. I love it, man. I love looking at birds. But find ways to connect with creation and recognize God's goodness. Acts of adoration. If he is the light and the life, we should shine his light. I'm going to give you some ideas. And the ideas I'm going to give you right now, one of these, every one of you, if you're a Christian, can do one of these ideas to shine the light of Jesus this Christmas season. And I encourage you to think, which is one, of the, one or more of these? Try one of these things. Number one, invite someone to this Adore series. If you heard this sermon, you're like, I think I got friends that could listen. They don't go to church, but they might enjoy this. Send them a link to this message. Send them to our website and just say, it's the most current sermon we have. And, but this, and invite them to this series. And, and if they come with you in the courtyard or come with you and park next to you so you can wave at each other or if they come with you online, talk with them about what they learned. So invite people to this series. Invite someone to the Christmas Eve service. We have three services planned, and they're all during the daytime when the sun is up. It's not a late night one that's going to get cold, not a midnight service. They're all going to be in the morning and afternoon, right here in the courtyard and online and in the parking lot. But invite someone to come to Christmas Eve. People are very open for Christmas Eve services. People kind of like that, even if they don't usually go to church. You can shine the light by inviting someone to hear about Jesus at our Christmas Eve service. 
Now we're gonna get a little more personal. Maybe what you could do is videotape yourself telling about how you became a Christian. Tell your story of when you put your faith in Jesus. For Sherry, it's when she was five. For me, it was when I was 15. For someone else, it might be when they were 30 or 40. Here's what I was like. Here's how I became a Christian. Here's the message I heard about Jesus, and here's how he's changed my life. And send that to some friends and family that don't know Jesus. Or write, if you're a writer, write it out. I mean, just send a little video sharing. People share videos, all kinds of stuff. Share your story. Or here's another one. You could make a little video of this. Here's one way that God has helped carry me through 2020. How has God helped me through this crazy year? I think people would find that fascinating. But you're saying, this is how God, my Savior Jesus, the Spirit in me, has carried me through this year. And share the story of how you came to know Jesus or just how Jesus is alive in your life and carrying you through this crazy year. Share your testimony. If you're not ready to do that yet, we put a video on our website. If you go on Shoreline's website and you click on Christmas, the very first thing, it says, a message of hope. Christmas at Shoreline, click on that. A message of hope, click on that. And there's about a 22-minute message that talks about the meaning of Christmas, the message of Jesus, in a way that would make sense to anybody. It's actually one that our women's ministry did with my wife, Sherry, to give in these boxes of hope, but we decided to share it more broadly. And so if you want to just share it, send that link to a friend, say, hey, this is a 22-minute video, 23-minute video about the meaning of Christmas. I'd love for you to watch it, and let's talk about it, what it means. If you don't want to maybe film yourself, we filmed somebody who shared that story. So watch it first, and then maybe share that with someone else. And then one last thing, in acts of adoration. How do we, if we're going to say, not just sing adore him, but we're going to adore him, how do we balance grace and truth? I'll give you a suggestion for some of you. There's a person in your life that has wronged you. They've hurt you in some way and you haven't forgiven them yet. The truth is they've hurt you, but you're a follower of Jesus, and you're called to forgive others as God in Christ forgave you. So could you in your heart this Christmas say, Lord, work in my heart so I can forgive them, and then let me reconnect with them in some way. If they ask you, why are you reconnecting now? You can say, actually, in a sermon I heard, my pastor was talking about how, as a Christian, I need to walk in more grace, and I haven't been very gracious. And I want to ask you, to forgive me for being unforgiving, but I also want to, you know, and I want to restore this relationship. What's it going to take? And watch what God can do. Uh, those are some ideas. But, but if you are going to, and I, and I believe you will, through this whole Christmas season, we're going to keep declaring who he is. We're going to say, oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Jesus, this is our prayer, that we will adore you, that we will worship you and praise you and celebrate you but that that adoration will permeate our hearts and our lives and our minds and our actions and our attitudes. And we would adore you as we walk in the truth. We would adore you as we extend grace. We would adore you as we celebrate your creation. We would adore you as we feel your presence with us no matter what we're facing. Oh God, come let us adore Jesus who came among us, who left the glory of heaven, who didn't avoid us, but came so near that he could dwell within us. And let your light and love shine from us to others. This whole Christmas season and year round, we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple of words of encouragement. I want to encourage you to take that envelope for a first gift or you at home be praying about that and you go on the website. And I'm praying that God will provide all we need before January 1 for next year to get that foundation in place to launch us into a great year of outreach, even in a challenge. Some people said to me, why would we be doing new initiatives in such a difficult time? Well, because if Christians didn't do initiatives, new initiatives in difficult times, we'd never do anything. We're gonna keep pressing forward, trusting that God's gonna provide. So consider doing that. If you want prayer, Pastor Roy is gonna be right up there. He's right there now at the top of the stairs here. Please go see Pastor Roy. Let him pray for you before you leave the courtyard here. If you're online and you need prayer, there's information right on your screen. Respond to that. And we have people waiting to pray with you and for you. And we wanna walk alongside of you in whatever your need is. And then if you're new at Shoreline, if you're online, there's now information that says, if you'll text the word welcome to that, to that number, we'll follow up and send you a digital connection card and we wanna get to know you and answer your questions about the church. And if you're in the courtyard or if in your cars uh, and you are new, I want to encourage you. I met three new people last service. That it was their first Sunday at Shoreline here in the courtyard. And I encourage them all to go back to see Patty. She's where the balloons are at the last uh, tent in the courtyard there. She's got a gift for you and wants to answer your questions about Shoreline Church. And so be sure you see her before you head out. 
And then after I give you a word of blessing to send you off, uh, if you're in, in your spots there, before you leave your, your carpet squares there, put your mask back on. We are doing great as a church. We are following all the guidelines. We are staying healthy. We really are as a church. Humbly, thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's keep doing that. So if you're like, I don't care about this. I'm big on hugging. Don't do it in our courtyard because it might be caught on film and then we might get in trouble. We, we want to just keep following the rules so we can keep doing what we're doing. Amen? Because I love doing this, don't you? So now in, in your cars... At home, in the courtyard, would you receive this word of blessing? Even though we occasionally avoid people, may you walk in the presence of the God who never avoids you, who never goes to the other side of the street, who never puts you in voicemail. May you walk in the presence of the God who has drawn near. He is Emmanuel, God with you. Experience his presence and share it with others this Christmas season. God bless you. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday when we talk about adoring the one who is the Messiah. What does it mean to say Jesus is the Messiah? You're going to have some new learning next week that's going to touch your heart and your life. So stay where you are until our people come to dismiss you. And then once they do, get your mask on. In the meantime, talk with people around you with the appropriate distance and have a great day. God bless you.